We're here at the Congress. We're here uh, not only talk about technology, we also talk about social and ethical responsibility. Um, about how we can change the world for good. The Good Technology Collective supports the development guidelines, sorry, it supports the development process of new technology with ethical engineering guidelines that offer a practical way to take ethic and social impact into account. Yannick Lerete, and I hope this was okay, will tell you more about it. Please welcome on stage with a very warm applause, Jan Lerete. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so before we start, can you kind of show me your hand if you like work in tech, building products as designers, engineers, coders, product management? Okay, so it's like 95%, 90%. Great. Um, yeah, so today we kind of try to answer the question, um, what is good technology and how can we build better technology? Um, before that, shortly something about me. So I'm Jan, I'm French-German, kind of a hacker, I'm in CCST for a long time, entrepreneur, I like co-founded a startup in Berlin, and I'm also a founding member of the Good Technology Collective. The so Good Technology Collective was founded uh, about a year ago, almost over a year now, actually, um, uh, by a very diverse expert council, and we kind of like three areas of work. Um, the first one is trying to educate the public about current issues with uh, technology, then to educate engineers how to build better technology, and then long term, hopefully one day, um, we'll be able to work like in legislation as well. Um, here um, is a bit of what we achieved so far. Um, we have like 27 council members now. We have several media partnerships and published around 20 articles, that's kind of the public education part. Then we organized or participated in roughly 15 events already. Um, and we are now publishing one standard, well, kind of today, actually. Um, and, <laughs> and if you're interested in what we do, then uh, yeah, sign up for the newsletter, and um, we keep you up to date, and you can join events. Um, so as I said, the expert council is really, really diverse. Um, we have everything from people in academia um, to people in government to technology makers to philosophers, authors, journalists. And the reason that is the case is that a year ago, we kind of noticed that in our own circles, like as technology makers or academics, we were all talking about a lot of kind of voice on developments in technology, but no one was really kind of getting together and looking at it from all angles. And there have been a lot of very weird and troublesome developments in the last two years. I think we really finally feel, um, you know, like the impact of filter bubbles, something people have talked for like five years, but now it's like really like, you know, deciding over elections and um, people become politically radicalized and societies kind of polarized more because they only see a certain opinion anymore. We have um, situations that we only knew like from science fiction, which is kind of, you know, pre-crime, like governments kind of overarching and trying to use machine learning to make um, decisions on whether or not you should go um, to jail. We have more and more machine learning and big data and optimization going basically every single aspect of our lives and not all of it has been, has been posi uh, positive. You know, like literally everything from e-commerce to banking to, to navigating to moving through the world now goes through these interfaces um, that presents us the data and a slice of the world at the time. And then at the same time, we have really positive developments, right? We have things like this, you know, like space travel, finally something's happening again. We have huge advances in medicine. Um, maybe soon we'll have like safe driving cars and great renewable technology. And it kind of begs the question, how can it be that um, good and bad uses of technology are kind of showing up at such an increasing rate in this like 
on such extremes, right? And maybe the reason is just that everything got so complicated, right? Data is basically doubling every couple of years, so no human can possibly process anymore. So we had to build more and more complex algorithms to process it, connecting more and more parts together. And no one really seems to understand it anymore, it seems. Um, and that leads to unintended consequences. I have an example here. So Google Photos, this is actually already two years ago, launched a classifier to automatically go through all of your pictures and tell you what it is. So you could say, show me the picture of the bird in summer at this location and would find it for you. Um, kind of really cool technology, and they released it to like, the entire user base until someone figured out that people of color were always marked as gorillas. So, of course, it was a huge PR disaster, right? Somehow no one found out about this before it came out. But now the interesting thing is, in two years, they didn't even manage to fix it. So their solution was to just block all kind of apes. So they're just not found anymore, and that's how they solved it, right? But if even Google can't solve this, um, what does it mean? And then at the same time, you know, sometimes we seem to have kind of intended consequences. Um, I have an example, another example here, Uber Grayball. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Um, so Uber was very eager to change regulation and push their services globally as much as possible and kind of starting a fight with, you know, all the taxi laws and regulation and taxi drivers and the various countries around the world. And what they realized, of course, is that they didn't really want people to be able to, like, investigate uh, what they were doing or like finding individual drivers. So they built this absolutely massive operation which was like crawling data in social media profiles, linking like your credit card and location data to find out if you were working for the government. And if you did, you would just never find a car. It would just not show up, right? And <laughs> that was clearly intentional, right? So at the same time, they were pushing like on like the lobbyism, political side, to change regulation while heavily manipulating the people that are pushing um, to change the regulation, right? Which is really not a very nice thing to, to do, I would say. And the thing that I find kind of worrisome about this, no matter if it's intended or unintended, is that it actually gets worse, right? The more and more systems we interconnect, the worse these consequences can get. And I have an example here. So this is a screenshot uh, I took of Google Maps yesterday. And you notice there are like certain locations that are kind of highlighted on this map. And I don't know if you knew it, but this map and the locations that Google highlight um, look different for every single person. Actually, I went again and looked today, and it looked different again. So Google is already heavily filtering and kind of highlighting certain places, like maybe this restaurant over there, if you can see it. Um, and I would say, like, from just opening the map, it's not obvious to you that it's doing that, or that it's trying to decide for you um, which place is interesting for you. However, that's probably not such a big issue. But the same company, Google with Vimo, is also developing this, and they just started deploying them, self driving cars. They're still a good couple years away from actually making it reality, but they are really, in terms of like, all the they're trying it at the moment, um, the fastest, I would say. And uh, in some cities, they started deploying self driving cars. So now, just think like five, ten years into the future, and you have signed up in your Google self driving account. Probably you don't have your own car anymore, right? So you go in the car, and we were like, hey, Jan, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to work? Because, I mean, obviously, that's, that's where I probably go most of the time. Do you want to go to your favorite Asian restaurant, like the one we just saw on the map? Um, which is actually not my favorite, but the first time I went to, so Google just assumed it was. Do you want to go to another Asian restaurant? Because, obviously, that's all I like. And then McDonald's because everyone goes there. And maybe the fifth entry is an advertisement. And you would say, well, Jan, you know, that's still kind of fine. Right? That's okay, because I can still click on 
no, I don't want these five options. Give me like the full map. But now we went back here. So even though <laughs> you are seeing the map, you are not actually seeing all the choices. So at Google, is actually filtering for you where it thinks you want to go. So now we have, you know, the car like the symbol of mobility and freedom um, that enabled so much change in our society that it actually reducing the part of the world that you see. And because, I mean, these days they call it AI, I think it's still just machine learning, uh, because these machine learning algorithms all do pattern matching and basically just can recognize similarities. When you open the map and you zoom in and you select a random place, it will only suggest places to you where other people have been before. So now the restaurants that open around the corner will probably not even discover it anymore. And no one will. And will probably close. And the only ones that will stay are the ones that are already established now. And all of that without being really obvious to anyone we use the technology because it has become like kind of a, a black box. So while I do want self-driving cars, I really do. <laughs> I don't want a future like this, right? And if we want to prevent that future, future, I think we have to first ask a very simple question, which is who is responsible for designing these products? So do you know the answer? Say it louder. We are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> right. That's a really frustrating thing about it, that actually it's us. Right. As engineers and developers, you know, we are always driven by perfection. We want to create like the perfect code, solve this one problem really, really nice, you know, chasing the next challenge over and over, trying to be first. Um, but we have to realize that at the same time, we are kind of working on frontier technologies, right? On things, technology that are really kind of on the edge of values and norms we have in, in society. And if we, if we are not careful and just like focus on our small problem and don't look at the big picture, then we have no say in on which side of the coin the technology will fall. And probably will take a couple of years, so by that time we are already moved on, I guess. So it's just that Technology has become so powerful and interconnected and impactful because we are now building stuff that is not affecting like 10 or 100 people or city, but literally millions of people. That we really have to take a step back and not only look at the individual problem, the challenge, but also the big picture. And I think if you want to do that, we have to start by asking the right questions. And the third first question, of course, is what is good technology? So <laughs> that's also the name of the talk. Unfortunately, um, I don't have a perfect answer for that. And probably we will never find a perfect answer for that. So what I would like to propose is um, to establish some guidelines and engineering processes that help us to build better technology that kind of ensure the same way we have quality insurance and project management systems and processes to like kind of distribute tasks within companies that what we build is actually has a net positive outcome for society. And we call it the good technology standard. We've kind of been working that um, over the last year. And we really wanted to make it really practical. And what we kind of realized that, that if you want to make it practical, you have to make it very easy to use, and also mostly actually what was surprising, just ask the right questions. So um, what is important, though, is that if you adapt the standard, it has to be in all project phases. Um, it has to involve everyone, so from like the CTO to like the project managers to actually legal. Right? Today, legal has this interesting role where you develop something, and then you're like, OK, now legal make sure that we can actually ship it. And that's what usually happens. And yeah, down to the invul engineer. And if it's not applied globally and people start making exceptions, then of course, it won't be worth very much. Generally, we kind of identified like four main areas um, 
that we think are important, kind of defined in kind of an abstract way, if a product is good. And the first one is empowerment. A good product should empower its users. And that's kind of a, a tricky thing. So as humans, we have very limited decision power, right? And we are faced with, as I said before, like this huge amount of data and choices. So it seems very natural to build machines and interfaces that try to make a lot of decisions for us, like the Google Maps one we saw before. But we have to be careful, because if we do that too much, then the machine ends up making all decisions for us. So often, um, when you develop something, you should really ask yourself, like, in the end, if I take everything together, am I actually empowering users, or am I taking responsibility away from them? Do I respect the individual choice, right? If they say, I don't want this, or they give you their preference, do I actually respect it, or do I still try to, you know, just figure out what is better for them? Um, do my users actually feel like they benefit from using the product? Um, <laughs> it's a question that actually not a lot of people ask themselves, because usually you think, like, in terms of, are you benefiting your company? And... I think what's really interesting in that aspect, does it help the users, the humans behind it, to grow in any way, right? If it helps them to be more effective or faster or do more things or be more relaxed or more healthy, right? Um, then it's probably positive, right? If you can't identify any of these, then you really have to think about it. And then in terms of AI and machine learning, um, are we actually kind of impacting their own reasoning so that they can't make proper decisions anymore. Um, the second one is purposeful product design. And that one is one that um, has been kind of a pet peeve for me for a really long time. So these days we have a lot of products that are kind of like this. I don't have something specifically against Philips Hue, but there seems to be like this trend that is kind of making smart things, right? You take a product, you put a Wi-Fi chip on it, just slap it on there, label it smart, and then you make tons of profit, right? And a lot of these new products we've been seeing around us, right? Everyone is saying, like, oh, yeah, we will have this great interconnected feature. But most of them actually not changing the actual product, right? Like, the Wi-Fi wi connected washing machine today is still a boring washing machine that breaks down after two years, but it has Wi-Fi, so you can see what it's doing when you're in the park. Um, and we think we should really think more in terms of intelligent design. How can we design it in the first place so that it's intelligent, not smart, that the different components interact in a way um, that it serves a purpose well? And kind of the intelligent by design philosophy is when you start with a new product, you kind of um, try to identify the core purpose of it. And based on that, you just use all the technologies available to rebuild it from scratch, right? So instead of building a Wi-Fi-connected washing machine, you would actually try to build a better washing machine. And if it ends up having Wi-Fi, then it's good, but it doesn't has to. And along each step, actually try to ask yourself, am I actually improving washing machines here? Or am I just creating another data point? And yeah, a good example for that is kind of a watch. Um, so, of course, it's very old analog technology. It was invented a long time ago. But back when it was invented, it was something you could have on your arm or in your pocket in the beginning. And it was kind of a natural extension of yourself, right? It kind of enhances your sense because it's never there. Uh, you don't really feel it, but when you need it, it's always there. And then you can just look at it and you know the time. And that profoundly changed how, like, we humans actually worked in society because now we couldn't meet at the same place at the same time. So when you build a new product, try to ask yourself, what is the purpose of the product? Who is it for? Often I talk to people and they talk to me for one hour about like the little, little details of how they solve the problem, but they can't tell me who their customer is. Then does this product actually make sense? Do I have features in here that distract my users that I maybe just don't need? And can I find more intelligent solutions by kind of thinking, outside of the box and focusing um, on the purpose of it. And then, of course, what is the long-term product vision? Like, where do I want this to go, this kind of technology I'm developing in the next years? So the next one is kind of 
societal impact that goes into what um, I talked about in the beginning with all the negative um, consequences we have seen. A lot of people these days don't realize that even if you're like in a small startup and you're working on, I don't know, a technology or robots or whatever, you don't know if your algorithm or your mechanism or whatever you build will be used by 100 million people in five years. Because this has happened a lot. Right? So already when starting to build it, you have to think, if this product would be used by 10 million, 100 million, maybe even a billion people like Facebook, would it have negative consequences? Right? Because then you get completely different effects in society, um, completely different engagement cycles and so on. Then are we taking advantage of human weaknesses? So this is arguably something that is just bad technology. <laughs> A lot of um, products these days kind of try to hack your brain, right? We understand really well how like engagement works and addiction. So a lot of things like social networks actually have been focusing, you know, and also built by engineers, you know, trying to get like a little number from 0.1% to 0.2 can mean that you just, through extensive A-B testing, create an interface that no one can stop looking at. You just continue scrolling, right? You just continue and then two hours have passed and you haven't actually talked to anyone. And um, this attention grabbing um, is kind of an issue. And we can see that uh, Apple actually now implemented screen time and they actually tell you how much time you spend on your phone. So there's definitely ways to build technology that even helps you to get away from these. And then for everything that involves AI and machine learning, you really have to take a really deep look at your data sets and your algorithms, because it's very, very easy to build in biases and discrimination. Um, and again, if you apply it to all of society, right, maybe people who are less fortunate or more fortunate, or they're just different, you know, they just do different things, kind of fall out of the grid and now suddenly they can't like groceries anymore or use Uber or Airbnb or just live a normal life or do finance transactions. And then kind of what I said in the beginning, not only look at your product, but also if you combine it with other technologies that are upcoming, other certain combinations that are dangerous. And for that, I kind of recommend to do like the black mirror litmus test. <laughs> Just try to come up with the craziest scenario um, that your technology could entail. And if it's not too bad, then probably you're good. Um, the next thing is kind of um, sustainability. Um, I think in today's world, it really should be part of a good product, right? Um, the first question is, of course, they're kind of obvious. Are we limiting product lifetime? Um, are we, do we maybe have planned obsolescence? Or if we build something that is so dependent on so many services, and we're not only going to support it for one year anyway, so that basically it will have to be thrown in the trash afterwards, right? Maybe it would be possible to add a standalone mode or a very basic fallback feature so that at least the product continues to work, especially if you talk about things like home appliances. Um, then what is the environmental impact? Um, a good example here would be, you know, cryptocurrencies who are now using as much energy as certain countries. Um, and when you consider that, just think, like, is there maybe an alternative solution that doesn't have such a big impact? And of course, we are still capitalism, it has to be economically viable, but often there are, and often it's, again, just really small tweaks. And then, of course, um, which other services are you working with, right? Um, for example, I would say, like, as European companies, you're in Europe here, um, maybe try to work mostly with suppliers from Europe, right, because you know they follow the GDPR and strict rules, and not as the US, or um, check your supply chain if you build hardware. And then for hardware specifically, that's because I also have like a, we also do hardware in my company, I always find that interesting. Um, we're kind of in a world where everyone tries to save like the last little bit of money out of every device that is built. And often like the difference between <laughs> a plastic and a metal screw is like half a cent, right? And at that point, it doesn't really change your margins much. And maybe as an engineer, you know, just say no and say, you know, we don't have to do that. The savings are too small to redesign everything, and it will impact the product quality so much that it just breaks earlier. These are kind of the main four points. I hope that makes sense. Um, then we have two more kind of additional checklists. Uh, the first one is data collection. 
Um, so really just, if, especially like in terms of like IoT, you know, everyone focuses on kind of collecting as much data as possible without actually having an application. And I think we really have to start seeing that as a liability and instead try to really define the application first, define which data we need for it, and then really just collect that. And we can still start collecting more data later on. And that can really prevent a lot of these negative cycles you have seen by just having machine learning algorithms, one of it kind of unsupervised and seeing what comes out. Um, then also kind of really interesting, I found that many times, like a lot of people are so fascinated by the amount of data, right? It's just try to have as many data points as possible. But very often you can realize exactly the same application with a fraction of data points, because what you really need is like trends. And that usually also makes your product more efficient. Um, then how privacy intrusive is the data we collect, right? There's a big difference between let's say the temperature in this building and everyone's individual movements here. And if it is privacy intrusive, then we should really, really think hard if we want to collect it, because we don't know how it might be used at a later point. And then, are we actually collecting data without people realizing that they do it? Right? Especially if you look at Facebook and Google, they're collecting a lot of data without really implicit consent. But right? of course, at some point, you like, all agree to the privacy policy, but it's often not clear to you when and which data is collected. And that's kind of dangerous and kind of in the same way if you kind of build dark patterns into your app um, that uh, kind of fool you into sharing even more data. Um, I had like an example that someone told me yesterday, I don't know if you know Venmo, which is this um, American a system where you pay each other with your smartphone basically to split the bill in a restaurant. By default, all transactions are public. So there are like 200 million public transactions, which everyone can see, including uh, the description of it. So for some of the more, uh, maybe not so legal payments, that was also very obvious, right? And it's totally unobvious when you use the app that that is happening, right? So that's definitely a dark pattern uh, that they're employing here. And then the next point is user product education and transparency. Is the user able to understand how the product works? And of course, we can't really ever have a perfect explanation um, of all the intricacies of the technology. But these days, um, for most people, almost all of the apps, the interfaces, the building technology they interact with is a complete black box. And no one is really doing an effort to explain it to them, right? Most companies advertise it like this magical thing, right? But that just leads to kind of this alienization where you just look at it and you don't even try to understand it. Um, I'm pretty sure that no one ever, like, um, these days is still, like, opening up a PC and try and looking at it components, right? Because everything is in a tablet and it's integrated and it's sold to us as, like, this magical... Uh, media consumption machine. Um, then are users informed when decisions are made for them? So we had that in empowerment um, that we should try to reduce the amount of decisions we make for the user. But sometimes it's a good thing to do. But then is it transparently communicated, right? I would be totally fine with Google Maps filtering out for me the points of interest if it would actually tell me that it's doing that. And if it can understand why it made that decision and why it showed me this place. And maybe also have a way to switch it off if I want. But today we seem to kind of assume that we know better for the people, right? So we found the perfect algorithm that has a perfect answer. So we don't even have to explain how it works, right? We just do it and people will be happy. But then we end up with these very negative consequences. And then, and that's more like a marketing thing. How is it actually advertised? Um, I find it, for example, quite worrisome that Things like um, Siri and Alexa and Google Home are like sold as these magical AI machines that make your life better and are your personal assistant. But in reality, they're actually still pretty dumb pattern matching. Um, and that also creates a big disconnect because now you have children growing up uh, who actually think that Alexa is a person. And 
that's kind of dangerous. And I think we should try to prevent that because um, for these children, basically, it kind of creates this, this whale and it's uh, humanized. Um, and that's especially dangerous if then the machine starts to make decisions for them and suggestions because they will take them as if a human did it for them. So, what is that? So, um, these are kind of the main areas. So, of course, it's a bit more complicated. Um, so, we uh, just published the standard today uh, in the first draft version. And uh, it's basically three parts. It's like the introduction, um, kind of the questionnaire and checklist that you just saw, and then actually how to implement it in your company, um, which processes to have, at which point you basically should have kind of a feature gate. And I would kind of ask everyone to go there, look at it, contribute, share it with people. Um, we hope that we'll have a final version ready uh, kind of in Q1 and um, that by then people can um, start to implement it. Oh, yeah. So, even though we have this standard, right, I want to make clear, having such a standard and implementing it in your organization or for yourself or your project, which would be great, right, actually doesn't remove your responsibility, right? Um, this can only be successful if we actually all accept that we are responsible, right? If today I build a bridge as a structural engineer and the bridge breaks down because I miscalculated, I'm responsible. And I think equally we have to accept that if we build technology like this, we also have to kind of assume that responsibility. And before we kind of move to q and A, I I'd like to kind of um, tell you this citation. So this is Shamas Palyapitya, a uh, former Facebook executive from the really early times, and also around a year ago when we actually started GTC, he said this in a conference. I feel tremendous guilt. I think in the, back in the deep recesses of our mind, we knew something bad could happen. But I think the way we define it is not like this. It now literally is at a point where we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. And personally, and I hope the same for you, I do not want to be that person that five years down the line realizes that they built their technology. So if there's one takeaway that you can take home from, from this talk, then to just start asking yourself, what is good technology? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for the products you built? And what does it mean for your organization? Thanks. Thank you. Jan Leretai. Do we have questions in the room? There are microphones. Microphones number one, two, three, four, five. Um, if you have a question, please speak loud into the microphone as the people in the stream want to hear you as well. I think microphone number one was the fastest. So please. Okay. Thank you for your talk. I just want to make a short comment first and then ask a question. I think this last thing you mentioned about offering users the options to have more control of the interface is also a problem that users don't want it because when you look at the statistics of how people use uh, online web tools, only maybe 5% of them actually use the options. So companies remove them because for them it seems like uh, it's something not so efficient for user experience. So this was just one thing to mention, and maybe you can respond to that. But what I wanted to ask you was that um, all these principles <clears throat> that you presented, they seem to be very sound and interesting and good. Uh, we can all accept them as developers, but how would you propose to actually sell them to companies? Because if you uh, adopt a principle like this is an in individual based on your ideology or the way that you think, okay, it's great, it will work, but how would you convince a company which is driven by profits to, to adopt these practices? Have you thought of this and what's your um, idea about this? Is Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe to the first part. Um, first, that giving people choice is something that people do not want and that's why companies removed it. Um, 
I think if you look at the development process, um, it's basically like a huge cycle of optimization and user testing geared towards a very specific goal, right, which is usually set by leadership, which is like bring your engagement up or increase user amount by 200%, right? So I would say the goals were or are today mostly misaligned, and that's why we end up with interfaces that are in a very certain way, right? If we set the goals differently, um, and I mean, that's why we have like UN UX research, I'm very sure we can find ways to build interfaces that are just different and still engaging, but also gives that choice. Um, to the second question, I mean, um, it's kind of interesting. So uh, I wouldn't expect a company like Google <laughs> to implement something like this because it's a bit against that business model by, by that point probably. But I've met a lot of uh, like also high-level executives already who are actually very aware of um, kind of the issues of technologies that they built, right? And um, there's definitely interest there, also like in like more like industrial side and so on, especially with something like self driving cars to actually adopt that. And in the end, I think, you know, if everyone actually demands it, then there's a pretty high probability that it might actually happen, right? Especially as workers in the tech field, we are quite flexible in the selection of uh, our employer. So I think if you give it some time, um, that's definitely something that's um, very possible. The second aspect is that actually, um, if we look at something like Facebook, um, I think they overdid it, right? They optimized it so far and pushed the engagement machine and kind of triggering like your brain cells to, to never stop going on the side and keep scrolling that uh, people got too much of it and now they're leaving the platform in troughs. And of course, Facebook will not go down, right? They own all these other social networks. But for the product itself, um, as you can see that long term, it's not even necessarily a positive business outcome, right? And everything we are advertising here still allows you to have very profitable businesses, right? It's just tweaking the right screws. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the interwebs. Uh, yes. Asks, uh, a question that goes into a similar direction. Um, in recent months, we had numerous reports about social media executives forbidding their children to use the products they create at work. <laughs> I think these people know that their products are made addictive deliberately. Do you think your work is somewhat superfluous because big companies are doing the opposite on purpose? Right, I think that's where you have to draw the line between intentional and unintentional, right? If we go to intentional things like what Uber did and so on, right, at some point it should probably become a legal issue. Um, unfortunately, we are not there yet, and usually like regulation is kind of lagging way behind. So I think for now we should focus on, you know, the more unintentional consequences, of which they are plentiful um, and kind of appeal to the good in, in humans. <laughs> okay, microphone number two, please. Yeah, thank you for sharing your ideas about um, educating the engineer. Um, what about um, educating the, the customer, the, the consumer who uh, purchases the product? Yeah, so um, that's a really valid point, right? Um, as I said, I think or recent actually as a GTC, like part of your product development um, and the way you build a product should also be how you educate your users on how it works. Um, generally, we have a really big um, kind of technology literacy problem, right? Things have been moving so fast in the last years that most people haven't really catched up and they just don't understand things anymore. Um, and I think, again, that's like a shared responsibility, right? That you can't just do that like in the tech field. You have to talk to your relatives, to people. Um, that's why we are doing like this series of articles and media partnerships to kind of explain and make these things transparent. Um, one thing which we uh, just started working on is a children's book because um, for children, like the entire world just exists with these shiny glass surfaces and they don't understand at all what is happening. Um, but it's also prime time to explain to them like really simple 
machine learning algorithms, how they work, how like filter bubbles work, how decisions are made. And if you understand that from an early age on, then maybe you'll be able to deal with what is happening um, in a way better and educated way. But I do think that is a very long process. And the earlier we start and the more work we invest in that, um, the earlier people will be better educated. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Thanks for sharing your insights. Um, I feel like uh, while you presented these rules along with their meaning, um, the specific selection might seem a bit arbitrary. And for my personal acceptance and willingness to implement them, um, it would be interesting to know the reasoning besides common sense that justifies this specific selection of rules. So um, it would be interesting to know if you looked at examples from history or if you just sat down and discussed things or if you just grabbed some rules out of the air. And um, uh, so I, I, my question is, uh, what influenced you for the development of these specific rules? Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated question. So how did we come up with this specific selection of rules and also like the main building blocks of what we think uh, should good technology be? Um, well, let's say first what we didn't want to do, right? We didn't want to create like a value framework and say like, this is good, this is bad, don't do this kind of research or technology because um, this would always be outdated, it doesn't apply to everyone. Um, we probably couldn't even agree in the expert council on that because it's very diverse. Um, generally, we tried to um, get everyone on the table and we talked about issues we had, like, for example, as me as an entrepreneur in terms of like in developing products um, with our own engineers. Um, issues we've seen um, in terms of public perception, um, issues we've seen like on a uh, more governmental level. Um, then also, uh, we also have like futurologists in there, so um, we looked at that as well. And then we made a really, really long list <laughs> and um, kind of started clustering it. And uh, a couple of things um, did get cut off, but generally, um, based on the clustering, these were kind of the main themes that we saw. And again, it's, it's really more of a tool for yourself as a company that develops and the designers and engineers to really understand the impact and evaluate it. Right? This, this is what these questions are aimed at. Um, and we think that for that, they uh, do a very good job. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think microphone number two has a question again. Uh, hi. I was just wondering how you've gone about engaging with other standards bodies that perhaps have a wider representation. It looks largely like from your team of um, the council currently that there's not necessarily a lot of engagement outside of Europe. So how do you go about getting representation from Asia, for example? Um, no, at the moment, uh, you are correct. The GTC is a uh, mostly European initiative, pan-European. Um, we are in talks with other organizations who work on similar issues and like regularly exchange ideas. Um, but yeah, we thought we should probably start somewhere in Europe is actually a really good place um, to start like a societal discourse about technology and the impact it has and also to, to have change, right? I think if we, for example, compare to um, things like Asia or the US where they have a very different perception of like privacy and technology um, and progress and like rights of the individual, um, Europe is actually a really good place to do that and we can also see things like uh, GDPR regulation um, that actually because it's kind of complicated, it's also kind of a big step forward in terms of um, protecting the individual from exactly these kind of consequences. Um, of course, though, long term, would like to expand this um, globally. Thank you. Microphone number one again. Oh, hello. Uh, just a short question. I couldn't find a donate button on your website. Uh, <laughs> do you accept donations? Is, is money a problem? Like, do, do you need it? Uh, yes, we do need money. Uh, however, it's a bit complicated because uh, we 
want to stay as independent as possible. So we are not accepting uh, project-related money. So you can't like say we want to do a certain research project with you. It has to be unconditional. Um, and the second thing we do is for the events we organize. Uh, we usually have sponsors that provide like venue and food and logistics and things like that. Um, but that's then for the event. And again, they can't like change the program of it. Um, so if you want to do that, you can come into contact with us. Uh, we don't have a mechanism yet for individuals to donate. We might add that. Cool. Thank you. Did you thought about Patreon or something like that? Um, we thought about quite a few options, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's actually not so easy to to not fall into the traps that like as organizations in space have have been where like. Google at some point sweeps in and is like, hey, do you want all this cash? And then uh, very quickly, uh, you have a big conflict of interest. Even if you don't want it, it, it happens, ends up happening. Yeah, right. Um, number one, please. Hi, I was wondering, how do you uh, um, unite the second and third points in your checklist? Because the second one is intelligence by design. The third one is to take into account future technologies, but companies do not want to push back their technologies endlessly to take into account future technologies. And on the other hand, they want to compromise their own design too much. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, I got it. So you were saying if we should always drop these like future scenarios and the worst case and everything, and incorporate every possible thing that might happen in the future, we might end up doing nothing because everything looks horrible. Um, for that, I would say, like, we are not like technology haters, right? We are all from areas working in tech. Um, so, of course, the idea is that you kind of just take a look at what is there today and try to make an assessment based on that. And the idea is if you look it up and read the standard, is that over time, actually, you try to when you add new major features, to look back at your assessment from before and see if it changed. Right, so the idea is you kind of create a snapshot of how it is now, and um, this kind of document that you end up with as part of your documentation kind of evolves over time as your product changes and the technology around it changes as well. Thank you. Um, microphone number two. So thanks for the talk and especially the effort. Um, just to echo back the question that was asked a bit before on starting with Europe, um, I, I do think it's a good option. Um, what, I, what I'm a little bit worried is it might be the only option and it might become irrelevant rather quickly because it's easy to, or it's relatively, it's less hard to implement maybe in Europe now. Uh, okay. The question is, uh, it might work in Europe now, but if Europe doesn't have the same economical power, it cannot bargain as much politically with, let's say, China or uh, the US and Silicon Valley. So will it still be possible and relevant if the economical balance shifts? Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we have to start somewhere, right? Um, just saying, oh, the balance will shift uh, anyway. Google will invent singularity, and that's why we shouldn't do anything. Is I think one of the reasons why we actually got here, right? Kind of this assumption that um, there's like this really big picture that is kind of working against us. So we all do our small part to um, fulfill that that kind of evil vision by not doing anything. Um, I think we have to start somewhere, and uh, I think for Having operated for one year, we have been actually quite successful so far, and we have a good progress. And I'm totally looking forward to make it a bit more global and to start traveling more. I think we had like one event outside Europe last year in the US, um, and that will definitely increase over time. And we are also working on making um, kind of our ambassadors um, more mobile and kind of expand to other locations. So it's definitely on the roadmap, right? It's not like we're <laughs> just staying here, but yeah, you have to start somewhere. And that's what we did. Nice, thank you. Number one, please. Yeah, one thing I haven't found was um, how those general re rules you formulated fit into the, the more general rules of society, like um, uh, constitutional rules. Um, 
have you considered that um, and it's just not um, clearly stated or, and will it be stated or um, did you develop them more from the bottom up? Um, yes, you are completely right. So um, we are defining the process and the questions to ask yourself, but we are actually not defining a value framework. Um, the reason for that is that societies are different, right? As I said, like there are widely different expectations towards technology, privacy, um, how societies should work all around the world. Um, the second one is that every company is also different, right? Every company has their own company culture and things they want to do and they don't want to do. Um, if I would say, for example, um, we would have put in there, you should not build weapons or something like that, right? That would mean that all these companies that work in that field couldn't try to adapt it. And while I don't want them to build weapons, maybe in their way you framework, that's okay. And we don't want to impose that, right? Um, that's why I said in the beginning, we actually, even though we call the Good Technology Collective, we are not defining what it is. And I think that's really important. We are not trying to impose our opinion here. We want others to decide for themselves what is good and kind of support them and guide them in building products that they believe are good. Thank you. Number two. <laughs> Hello, thanks for sharing. Uh, as engineer, we always want users to spend more time to use our product, right? But uh, I'm working at mobile game company. Yep. Uh, we, are making, we are making a word that users love our product. So we want users to spend more time in our game so we may make a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> but uh, when users spend time to play our game, they may lose something. Yep, you know. So how do you think about the balance in a uh, game, mobile game? Yep. Um, it's a really difficult question. So the question was like specifically for mobile gaming, um, where's kind of the balance between trying to engage people more and um, yeah, basically making them addicted and having them spend all their money, I, I guess. Um, I personally would say um, it's about intent, right? Um, it's totally fine to have a business model where you make money with a game. I mean, that's kind of good and people do want entertainment. But if you actively use um, like research in how like, you know, like the brain actually works and how it gets super engaged and um, if you basically build in like gamification and lotteries, which a lot of things have done, where basically your game becomes a slot machine, right? So you always want to see the next, the next opening of a crate and see what you got, um, kind of making it a luck-based game, actually. I think if you go too far into that direction, at some point you cross the line. Uh, where that line is, you have to decide yourself, right? Some of it could be a good game dy dynamic, but there are definitely some games out there, I would say, where it quite reasonable to say that they pushed the limit quite a bit too far. And if you actually look how they did it, because they wrote about it, they actually did use very modern research and very extensive testing to really find all these, all these patterns um, that make you addicted. And then it's not much better than an actual slot machine. And that probably we don't want. So it's also an ethical question for each and every one of us, right? Yes. Um, I think there's a light, and I think this light means the interwebs has a question. Uh, there's another question from Ploy about practical usage, I guess. Um, are you putting your guidelines at work in your company? You said you're an entrepreneur. That's a great question. Um, yes, we will. Uh, so we kind of just completed them. There's kind of a uh, lot of work to get there. Uh, once they are finished and released, we will definitely be one of the first adopters. Nice. And uh, with this, I think we're done for today. Perfect. Jan, people, warm applause. <laughs> <laughs>